a part in research and uh, work with Christopher Alexander uh, in the Center for Environmental Structure uh, in Berkeley. Now, um, in my office, uh, I really um, deal with, you know, uh, the urban design, architecture, interior design, landscape design, which, as you will see from the lecture, I really regard as a one continuous uh, whole. And I published a book called um, The Act of Creation in the Spirit of a Place, Holistic Phenomenological Approach to Architecture. At the moment, I'm working on a script uh, for a film, documentary film, which I will direct uh, later. Now, um, if we look uh, um, in, uh, in you know, uh, architecture of the last, I think, 70 years, especially contemporary architecture, we see that um, phenomena that really architecture uh, lost in a way its sort of unique local identity. You know, we see the same architecture in China, Tel Aviv, Paris, London, wherever. And if we look at the magazines, you know, unless it is really stated where the building is, it's very difficult to tell. And I think um, this is really a bit unfortunate. Now, um, what I would like um, to present uh, in this lecture is really my interpretation and maybe uh, people from whom I learned to the holistic uh, phenomenological uh, worldview, uh, a worldview which embodies both, you know, the needs which are common to us as human beings, so in that sense they are really cross cultures and you know universal, but on the other hand it applies a planning process which is definitely responding, uh, you know, structurally responding uh, to the identity of any uh, cultural or social group or uh, to the physical reality uh, of the site itself. Now, uh, before I, I go into that, I would really like in few words to describe the school of thought I'm talking about into a more uh, historical uh, context so you know how it fits in. Uh, in the mid-60s, there was a real uh, uh, breaking point, uh, I think, in architecture. Um, people understood that modern architecture was in real bankruptcy in the sense that it didn't really give a decent answer to the human relationship uh, between man and environment. And uh, the result of that, you know, we can see, um, you know, uh, places like Brasilia, you know, in Brazil, Chandigarh in India, the new towns which were built, um, you know, uh, early 70s uh, in England. You know, I was a student at the AA at that time, and Milton Keynes was re, you know, the, the thing, you know, to do research on and whatever. And also the new neighborhoods which were built uh, after the sixth day was uh, around uh, Jerusalem. And, you know, in all these uh, um, uh, places, there was uh, a structured uh, disconnection between the house and the street, the street and the neighborhood, the neighborhood and the city as a whole, which really uh, resulted in a sort of feeling of alienation and detachment between men and, you know, and the environment. And um, out, uh, I think, of uh, that desperation came different movement, grew up, you know, different movement. We can mention the archigram in England, uh, you know, the postmodernist, the new tradition, uh, the deconstruction, which celebrates until these days. Um, now, all of these movements really try to find, you know, maybe another way. But um, as different as they were from each other, they shared one thing in common, and that is the basic assumption that behind good architecture, comfort, beauty, there is no real truth. And actually, everybody can do whatever he wants, and it is really a matter of styles and fashions. And because you know, they didn't regard beauty and comfort as an objective matters. There was no really um, 
real discussion what is a beautiful artifact or they never, they never dealt uh, with the essence of architecture. Now, there was another group in the Center for Environmental Structure in Berkeley, founded and headed by Chris Alexander, who thought differently. And their assumption was that behind good architecture and behind beauty and comfort, there are uh, very definite codes, you know, rules, and this is a matter uh, of and behind of which there are reasons and facts. So, um, if uh, which, and on, not only that, but you know, they treated it as if it is also uh, universal. Now, um, the purpose of architecture, as I see it, is really foremost to create human environment uh, for human, pe you know, for uh, human beings. And uh, as building affects the fate, you know, of our, the physical environment we live in and uh, our life, you know, uh, for many years, I think the real test of a building is the test of the time. And we cannot really regard architecture as fireworks or spectacles, you know, only. Now, when I uh, started to uh, work on my book, it was very clear to me that, you know, designing a public square, a building, uh, a chair, or a book is, ex by essence, is really the same. The only difference is, you know, the level of scale, um, uh, the context, of course, the specific of the media. Because what makes a building to be of timeless relevance is exactly what makes, uh, you know, a book or film to have a long life shelf. And that is the emotional, um, um, uh, the emotional feeling uh, uh, it creates. So, um, there, and there are, you know, uh, different ways in uh, describing this timeless quality I'm talking about, or this spiritual, I would say, emotional experience one has, is experiences in this kind of uh, places. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright said that this building, which have this, uh, spiritual feeling are the one which takes you beyond words. Chris Alexander said, you know, it's like the diagram of the inner universe or, or picture of the inner soul. And the Dalai Lama, you know, said that um, uh, this timeless quality is like uh, the nature of the reality or uh, the great self. So, you know, there are different uh, ways in describing that. Now, uh, contemporary architecture as a whole, of course, you know, in general, sought to dissociate themselves uh, from the world of feeling and really connecting the design process to the world of ideas. So what they did is creating really um, um, sort of rational and intellectual relationship between man and environment devoid from any emotions. Now, talking about a phenomenological approach to architecture, this is a, a school and community library I designed in Ramat Gan, which is close to Tel Aviv. And when I designed this library, I thought that, you know, beyond being, of course, has its formal role, you know, as a resource a center, I thought that the building has to be an educational lesson uh, by itself. And uh, I believe really that if you give somebody a place which is really comfortable and they feel good in it, they will also take care on, on it. And also, not only that, you know, but maybe this will increase their awareness for aesthetics and teach them how to be maybe critical about the physical environment we live in. So um, if we look at this library, uh, you know, it's really interesting, but you know, these energetic teenagers, when they come to this library, when just they step inside, their voice become very low, there is no graffiti, now it's been 10 years already there, it could, you know, they really take care of the place. And I think, you know, and before everybody told me that I have to do very strong materials, concrete and all of these, so they don't, you know, damage it. And I thought the opposite. If you give them really sort of a place where 
you know, um, it released some good feeling, you know, uh, that will do uh, the job. And um, And you know, this building was um, designed between two rows of trees, which I was not allowed, of course, to knock down. And in each place, you know, they sit really opposite the trees. They feel like in a forest. And what I mean is, you know, if you go to like uh, Buddhist temples or Zen gardens, you know, you can really feel what Buddhism is all about just by feeling, you know, uh, the place and with no really need for uh, textual, uh, you know, explanations. So, and of course this is the case in any building. This is a senior citizen day center which I designed at Tel Aviv. And, you know, in this place I really wanted the old citizens, you know, to feel here at home and not like as an institution. So this is the entrance courtyard. And this is what you see when you approach, you know, the entrance. So you have a through view to the garden. And you know, one day I came there, it's an interesting story, uh, and I saw, you know, that all these old people, uh, they brought their laundry from the house and they hang it, you know, to dry in, the, in this courtyard. And I was, you know, how architect is about these things. And uh, I told to the you know, director, how come you let them do these things? So she said, you know, they would never do it if they would not feel at home. So, you know, what could I say? This is a private house in Jerusalem, which I did. And again, I mean, you, f you think about, you know, what you want people really to experience. Um, you know, phenomenology is really about how directly a building is actually creating, you know, um, a, an experience that you feel by, you know, your senses in a very direct way. Now, this is the uh, Safad, you know, the Galilee uh, uh, city, uh, uh, the north part of Israel. This is the city of the Kabbalah. And this was the main spiritual center back in 15th, 16th century where the Jewish scholars came from Spain and Portugal where, you know, they expelled from and they came to sit uh, in Safad. Now, I'm a seventh generation descendant of a family living in this city uh, from the early 19th century. And I always thought, you know, that my feeling for this beautiful place is you know, very a subjective matter, of course, because, you know, um, all my personal roots, you know, connected, you know, to this place where uh, I grew. But then I realized that also other people who come from different cultures, from different places, different parts of the world, they are also moved when they walk in these lands in this city. So, and on, not only that, but, you know, if we look at all these places, which we want to come again and again, and um, although they are all rooted, you know, in different traditions, they in somehow, um, you know, create very similar feeling in all of us. So it's not only that they ha have, you know, similar feeling. And this on the right is Yosef Karo's synagogue, uh, uh, in Safad, 16th century. This is, uh, you know, uh, the pagoda in uh, Xi'an, and that, uh, you know, is the temple in Delphi, completely different cultures. And it's not only that they, you know, provoke uh, similar feelings, but we people who come, no matter from where we come from, we experience a very similar, in a very similar way, these places. So, um, the question was really, um, what is really behind this phenomena? Now, uh, let me uh, tell you, and I would like to make it clear that um, this, uh, you know, uh, timeless quality I'm talking about has nothing to do with the past. 
I mean, the past has no monopoly on beauty. And, you know, it did happen, of course, in the past, maybe more than today, for different reasons. And, you know, it happened here, different cultures, different places, different traditions, Turkey, Iran, you know, uh, Korea, whatever. But also, it did not happen in the past. And it can, of course, happen in the 20 and 20, uh, you know, in the 21st uh, century. So it's nothing to do with nostalgic, it's nothing to do with yearning to the past. And this, I think, is very important. Now, um, if we want, you know, to change uh, the feeling of the uh, uh, environment uh, we live in, and you really want to create places where people will feel at home, it is obviously not a matter of changing styles and fashion, but I believe it is transformation of our mechanistic worldview, which underlines, you know, current thoughts and approaches to the holistic uh, uh, approach. Now, um, as opposed, you know, uh, to the mechanistic approach, which really regards, you know, the house, uh, if we talk about architecture, uh, you know, the street, the neighborhood, and the city as autonomous fragments, you know, uh, the holistic approach really regards uh, the environment, the social environment, and the physical environment as a, a system. Um, and it's not only that, of course, we are talking about very um, definite uh, relationship between, you know, the parts which compose the whole, but each part of the environment, its existing totally relates on its relationship uh, to the whole. So um, we are really uh, talking about a, a dynamic whole and um, I would like to explain it through a project which I did. Um, uh, this was uh, built uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, this is uh, Bialik Square. This is the historic heart of the city of Tel Aviv. Um, and um, this orange building is the music center and library which I designed and built uh, in this place. Now, um, this area of Bialik, which is named after our national poet uh, Bialik, uh, is really a micro document of the history of Tel Aviv because it has buildings here from back from the 20s um, uh, to the 50s. Now, I think that the 20s in Israel was really the last period where uh, I would say you can identify Israeli architecture in the sense that, you know, these Jewish refugees who came from Germany from the war and settled in Israel, they very cleverly integrated um, the local architecture, which they found, you know, in Israel, the oriental architecture, with what they brought from there. And this is called, uh, this we call the eclectic period in Tel Aviv. Uh, you can see on the top uh, one on the left, this is the first city hall of Tel Aviv, which was built on the 20s. And this is, uh, in the bottom right, this is the uh, Bialik House, uh, which is also from the 20s. And then, of course, we have here the Bauhaus, the international style, which is like the building on the center, which I think was really the start of importing package, packages from somewhere else, which did not belong to the context or the spirit of this place, you know. Um, so I think from the 30s, things has been uh, changed. Now, when I designed this building, this is really the only contemporary layer added to these historic uh, places. And um, when you talk about um, adding a new intervention into a historic uh, place, you know, there are a few ways to look at it. Now, what I really um, thought is, you know, I didn't want to, um, uh, you know, to reconstruct the past in a very fanatic way, but neither to, reinforce a new order. So I was really looking for a language that will create, and anything is, to me is legitimate, anything which will really create a, a meaningful dialogue between, you know, the new building and uh, the existing environment. 
Now, talking about holistic approach, you know, when I started thinking about uh, the building, I really didn't think about the building, but I had to think about the square, because there is no square but for the building which compose it. So, um, you know, it's the scale, it's... Because what you want really to preserve is the spirit of the place. It's not really um, doing a replica of what's there, but really to preserve. And this square is really has a very, very beautiful, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, nice feeling. Now, obviously, um, uh, if you talk, uh, you know, about creating, you know, some good feeling in a place, always to do with the special order. But when you go down to it, I think that it's really to do with the details. And if you look here, this is the entrance. So on the, you know, on the uh, higher scale, um, you know, this is the part which connects the building also, you know, to the square. But then, if you go deeper, you know, then you have all the parts which actually are unfolded and complement, you know, uh, this uh, entrance place because. You know, the details um, of a building, like the tiles which, you know, I designed the patterns, or any detail, is not considered as, uh, you know, um, additions or ornaments for their own sake. But, you know, if you look, for instance, this is the uh, uh, auditorium inside the building, where I, you know, designed also, you know, the chairs and the lighting fixtures. Now, <clears throat> the details really are conceived as, you know, um, parts of one hierarchical language. Because to my mind, there is no such a domain as interior design, what's called today interior design, because it's really something which is just another level of scale. But there is no auditorium but for the details which compose it. So you don't add the stuff, but it's really sort of unfolded and complements and, and enhance, you know, uh, what is already there. And this is the uh, floor of, of the, you know, it's a small museum for displaying music instruments. So again, you know, um, the cabinets of the displays, the furniture e actually echoes, you know, one family. This is the reading room. That's the sterile case, which I think also ought to be, you know, um, a place and not just, you know, to go up and down. And this is the entrance lobby, you know, um, when you see the auditorium in front of you. Now, um, you know, the Shakers um, said always that um, there is no, uh, uh, you know, beautiful form uh, that doesn't flow from its function. But mind you, I don't think that uh, when they say it, it's really like the modernists who said, you know, form follow function, which really semantically be belonged only to the physical uh, body of the building. I think they meant much more. And if we look, this is, you know, the capital of the columns which I made. Um, the capital of the column has another function than the other parts of the column because this connects, you know, the column to the beam. So this is why it got, you know, another formal uh, expression. So, you know, each part has its uniqueness and power, but it's always uh, seen as a part of the system as a whole. And I like this example because, you know, this is really a nice example, the water gutter in a Japanese um, a courtyard where, you know, really the beautiful form flows from the functional need, you know, like the water flows from one to another very smoothly, very slowly, makes nice noise until the water hits the ground. So, um, so if, you know, I adopt this kind of uh, world view, I really... I uh, can't see, uh, as I said, urban design, building, interior design as disciplines which are really removed from each other, but
But if you look here, you know, the square, the building, the interior, the staircase, until the very detail is really uh, one continuous system. And if we talk about the fundamentals of the Buddhist teachings, this is really one of the fundamentals uh, saying, you know, um, the notion of uh, dependent arising, that actually no, uh, n nothing has an intrinsic existence, but everything is actually uh, formed, you know, by other causes. So uh, it's really a sort of a dynamic uh, uh, system where each part is actually caused by, uh, you know, uh, other causes. So, um, in this sense, now the question uh, that was raised really by Alexander was, okay, so um, if we look, you know, in places which have very similar patterns of event, and actually, um, you know, the feeling in these places are also uh, very similar. If we take, for instance, uh, these three piazzas, you know, the Washington Square, the Piazza in Siena or San Marco, although, uh, you know, they look very different in form, they have, first of all, the same pattern of event, of course, and they all create a very similar feeling. So the question, what, what is really behind it? And his assumption was that uh, behind what looks different in form, there is an underlying structure uh, or archetype of a structure which is common to all of them and is the same. And this is what he uh, pronounced, um, you know, the patterns uh, of space. So although things look different, there is some underlying structure or superstructure which is common to all. Um, and if we take, for instance, you know, this example, of course, um, you know, these trees are very different in form. And if we go to Africa and we see a tree that we've never seen before, how can we know it's a tree? Because what we recognize is not the form of the tree, but the pattern which is, you know, uh, underlines it. Um, and any pattern is actually a set of uh, interrelationship between the parts. And this is what repeats itself in an infinite uh, variety uh, of forms. So now, the interesting question going further is, okay, and anything is built out of patterns, but which are the patterns which are capable in releasing, you know, good feelings, the, you know, which compares, has the power to, you know, to, to make, you know, places where we feel really good. And the explanation for that was very similar to Noam uh, Chomsky uh, explanation in the spoken languages. Uh, where he said that, you know, among the different languages, there are the language of languages, and it is like innate patterns which are structured already in our mind. And this is how, you know, we can, although we come from different places, uh, traditions, we can learn languages. Uh, now, these inner pattern, innate patterns, which are, are structured already in our mind, this is very similar to the notion of the pattern language because the patterns here as well are reflecting something which is very basic to the human being, which is uh, actually uh, uh, somehow um, reflecting uh, uh, the structure of the brain. So, uh, and this is the explanation why different people, no matter from where they come, they experience things in a very similar way. Uh, way when, you know, of course, we talk about uh, emotions. And if we go to architecture back, you see we take a pattern of space, just an example, an entrance courtyard. You know, this is three different places. This is a private house which I designed uh, in Zichon. It has, you know, entrance courtyard. And that's the Senior Citizen Day Center. And on the top, it's a, a synagogue. Now, although, you know, all these uh, courtyards, they look different, they basically have the same job. This is actually a, um, you know, archetype of a structure which defines the relationship between the public and the private domains. And of course, in a synagogue, it has a much more profound meaning because it also uh, separates between the holy and the secular. Now, after you actually compose the pattern language for any project, um, 
stemming out from this worldview, really, is uh, if we think that you know a building should should grow up from the place you know it is built on. So literally, I'm every planning decision that I make is taking place on the site itself. What I mean is that you know the planning process or the methodology that I'm using is really inspired by what is there, by the reality of the place and or the spirit of the place. And when we talk about the spirit of the place, you know, it's the social context, it's the cultural context, and of course the physical context. So it's really like, uh, you know, meditating uh, on the place, really trying to be aware uh, on all the forces which are acting on the place. And the form which you get eventually, the building or anything, is a structure of balance between the patterns, which are quite abstract, and the forces which act uh, on the site itself. And it's big decision and it's small decision. You know, it's even placing you know, the window. And this window is basically a result of that whole uh, process which took uh, place. And after I put all these marks, and you know, the technique doesn't really matter. You can, what, is, what matters is you know, the, um, how you think about it. Uh, but um, it is surveyed, you know, and this becomes actually uh, the sketch and the basic uh, layout uh, of the building. And if you work in this way, you really see that sometimes deviation of 10% matters. You can kill a building or you can make it alive just, you know, by very, very small variations, which obviously you can't feel not on the computer or nothing else. Now, uh, this is just an example because, as I said, you know, eventually what you get is a structure of balance between, you know, uh, the patterns and uh, the forces acting on the side. If we take the same pattern, talking about positive outdoor space, the way you decide about that, Professor Zaligaros mentioned site repair. It's very similar. You have to decide where to locate the open spaces and, uh, you know, the building. Uh, so here, for instance, this is the house which I did in uh, Zichron. And, you know, you just walk around and you ask yourself, you know, uh, where would I like to sit and have my coffee? That's all. It's very simple and it's very quick, this process. You know, it's not doing 100 alternatives here and there and there. You're just very direct. You get the answer. So you, you come to the site with the questions. You come to the site with, you know, definite patterns which compose the language of the building, but then the answers you get uh, on the site itself. So the same pattern, when it applied in the senior citizen day center in Tel Aviv, there was no view, no nothing, but there were, you know, like nice trees, and it was quite obvious that this is going to be the open space of that building. So actually, you know, all the variations come because, you know, same patterns meet different site condition that which is making the variations. This is a private house which I did in Jerusalem and there was really a lemon tree uh, on the site and I decided, you know, the whole house and the courtyard to build around uh, that uh, lemon tree. And you see, if you're talking about composing a pattern language for a project, um, Obviously, what I said, you know, there are patterns which, no matter uh, where we come from, what tradition, they are basic, you, they are, you know, they actually respond to the basic needs of any human being. You know, anyone needs daylight, whatever. It doesn't matter where it is and what project it is. But then there are other patterns which directly, uh, you know, correspond, you know, to the context, of course, of the project. This is a synagogue, and I just wanted to show, this is now under construction. It's the Maimonide Central Sephardic Synagogue, which I built um, in Israel. Now here into the language came, here I really wanted to revive the traditional uh, patterns which uh, the Maimonide used, you know, in the synagogue, you know, which he used to pray. And there are very definite uh, patterns which uh, illustrate, you know, Sephardic synagogue. Uh, so you take these and you just, uh, come to the site, you know, and on the left we have like main entrance gate. This is a pattern, but in uh, synagogue it has a more profound meaning 
and this is the gates of prayer. So then I came to this site, and then I saw, you know, these two eucalyptus tree, and I decided that, you know, this is going to be the gate of the prayer, etc. And, you know, entrance courtyard, which uh, I talked already about. And, uh, you know, you have like the four pillars. You see in any Sephardic synagogue, or any synagogue almost, because it's a traditional pattern, and it, it is after the four materials. You know, it's not an arbitrary, you know, just thing. It is rooted in something. So then, this is the building uh, which now is under uh, construction. Or you have the 12 windows surrounding the dome. This is after the 12 tribes. So this is part of the pattern language as well, because you can't have a building, you know, in Tel Aviv, China, different. You have to put beyond the one which cross cultures, you have to put uh, the unique uh, ones. This, you know, it's <laughs> just I took it a few days ago. It's just uh, still on, under construction. Now, this is the last example I want to show you. This is a residential neighborhood uh, which I built in a kibbutz uh, in Israel. You know, kibbutz is an economic, social um, structure of a collective which was founded in Israel, um, you know, about 100 years ago. And, um, the, you know, the utmost um, value of the kibbutz was equality. Um, but equality, I would say, um, you know, was uh, more like um, a uniform, um, um, like a quantitative equality. I mean, everything had really to be the same. So very uniform, you know, um, wages, clothes, everything had to be basically uh, the same which was quite, to my mind, was very simplistic and, and, you know, dogmatic way of looking at the notion of equality. Now, in the last 20 years, this has been changed, you know. All the kibbutzes uh, went into privatization process, and I think housing was the, the last fortress of this dogmatic uh, vision of equality. And I tried, you know, to, to introduce a new model and saying, you know, that actually, um, we have to uh, really uh, compose a language which will be, of course, common to all the houses, but when it applied, you know, to different site conditions, different families, you know, everyone is a human being, it's not just a collective, uh, it will mean different houses, and which was quite, uh, you know, a new thing. And uh, all, practically all the decisions, again, were made on the site, starting, you know, from the course of the main pass, which I wanted, you know, slowly to see the water. So I was walking on the site and looking how um, this uh, will happen. And um, you see, uh, and the process I'm really talking about here, because it's a neighborhood, it's not just one house, it's a process of really um, uh, like a piecemeal process of unfolding because if you want each house to have the breeze and to have a glance at the water, you have to do it one by one. You know, you did one, then it's a reference point for the other one very slowly, you know, like this. And then the situation was really that each house in the neighborhood had, uh, you know, uh, views and breeze in between houses, in, you know, in, in different ways. So the whole layout was really done uh, on the site itself. Now, if we go to the houses themselves, you know, before, you know, the existing model is really using predetermined models of, you know, uh, uniform uh, houses, um, very, very arbitrarily positioned. Uh, you know, uh, on the side. To the right, this is the first, first houses uh, of the kibbutz, very simple ones, and the left, more sophisticated ones, but still the same, uh, uh, the same thinking, you know. It's a very static process of additions, you know, and not only that, but, you know, they used to, to use, you know, the same houses in the north part uh, of the country, in the desert, and because they treated the house, you know, like this, if you were lucky, you know, your window happened to 
overlooked the water, if not to the cow shed, because, you know, um, it was uh, really uh, something which was, you know, uh, uh, nothing really uh, related, you know, to the reality of uh, the site itself. Now, I mean, this is not only in the kibbutz. I mean, any suburban uh, uh, development, you see this kind. But here it was also out of ideology. So what I introduced was really a sort of more dynamic process whereby uh, the same patterns, the same budget, the same materials, you know, to create one language, of course, but uh, there were different houses. Now, the different houses was a result of, you know, when meeting different site conditions, this actually resulted in different types of houses. So you see it's, it's different houses, but basically belongs to the same uh, family. And um, also, you know, the, the open uh, outdoor areas in a kibbutz belongs to the collective. It's not private gardens. You are not allowed to put fences or stuff like that. So, um, and, and you know, when something belongs to everybody, basically it belongs to nobody. And uh, I didn't put fences, but the way we laid out the houses really somehow informally created private territories. And people started, you know, to grow their own plants and feel somehow sense of uh, privacy. So, you know, the layout actually changed a little bit the pattern of uh, behavior there. And this is um, the last one. Um, when I came three years after, you know, I was really surprised to see uh, that, you know, they grow these kind of trees. You know, it's lemon trees. It's really something which correlates, you know, really to the place. And I believe, I want to believe, but this is a fact, that once you lead a sort of living human process, which really, uh, you know, um, applies to the very basic instincts or intuitive, you know, of the people, they will follow it after you leave. So, you know, this was not under instruction. I was not there anymore. And you see these kind of things and, you know, because, uh, so I think, you know, um, maybe it did something. Now, um, you know, I really hope that by, uh, you know, introducing maybe, um, um, an approach which, on one hand, tries, you know, to um, to refer to the needs which are common to us all as human beings, and as I said, cross-cultural, but at the same time corresponds, you know, to the identity of each cultural group, of each social group, of each uh, uh, site. This somehow will maybe replace, I don't know, current thoughts and approaches which I also really feel it's quite a threat, you know, f to the physical and human uh, environment we live in. And of course, you know, I, I couldn't, uh, you know, I could only touch the things and I invite you to look at my book. Uh, it's in the library, you know, it can be ordered through your bookshop and anyway, and I put it also on the table there. And um, I hope, you know, uh, you will benefit from it. So thank you again very much.